Where's Dr. Jim? Where you at? I don't see you. Is he in there somewhere? So Dr. Jim beat me in first place. We were at the final table together. <clears throat> he goes in all in with Ace King. I'm like, come on. I called with Queen Jack. And the board came up nothing but a seven high. But it was a fun night. How's everyone doing this morning? Awesome. As you can see, I am half the size I was in that horrible video. Uh, so today we're actually going to do a little bit of an audible, uh, make a little bit of an adjustment to our schedule. We're going to do 50 reasons to use a public adjuster as your CE course this morning. And the reason we're going to do this class is because it's so uh, in tying with what Steve said this morning as well as the real need for public adjusting and the real reason that uh, you're in this business. And most people think one or two things as far as what they're able to do uh, or what we do for people. So yesterday we had uh, over 40 of the adjusters here for our meeting. And if I ask claim reps in general, what we do for people, they'll answer we get them more money. Uh, and it's such a small part of the actual overall adjustment process. So by understanding what we actually do and how many reasons people actually need us, they probably don't know why they need us. You may not know how to explain that, but I'll give you the really big key here. You probably don't realize that all the objections you ever encounter for someone in the business or using somebody uh, or somebody using our services is generally you don't know the answer to their objection. So understanding that our field adjusters, all of them are certified through the IICRC. This, we're not a regular public adjusting firm. Our adjusters all carry so many credentials behind their names and being certified with the IICRC and water and fire, which basically is water, mold, fire, and smoke. These two certifications allow our adjusters to be able to argue what we use, what we call the Bible, the S-500, which is the document that describes water mitigation, the only document written that is proven to the proper mitigation methods. So if you can't argue with the credentials behind your name, kind of like someone going out there and saying it's illegal to do something and I'll sue you and they're not a lawyer, they can't really do anything about it. But if you are certified in your industry and you have credentials, when you go to court and you testify, you get the, the benefit of the doubt. When we adjust losses with the insurance company, none of them are certified. Would anyone in this room Please throw out a loud answer and tell me why you don't think they're certified. Anyone know why the insurance company adjusters, none of them carry certifications? Anyone know why? They don't want them to know. If they're certified, they would actually have to pay for things that we're making them pay for, so they keep them in the dark. I, I'm always amazed. I meet guys 30 years in the business. I'm like, you don't have an IICRC certification? And they're like, no. And I'm like, the insurance industry doesn't want them to realize what should be paid for. Mitigation protocols are tough. Our vendors, CPR, they're all certified. Every technician in that entire company is certified because you need to do it correctly. So as a consumer, wouldn't you want to use a public adjuster where their adjusters are fully certified in both industries that affect most losses, water, fire, and smoke? That's a big selling point. So when someone says, oh, I have another adjuster that's going to do it for less, you might say, are they certified with the IACRC? Because if you don't say that and don't ask the question, don't give them the opportunity to think, what do you mean? You're hiring a guy to put brakes on, but he's not a certified mechanic. You're hiring a guy to fix your air conditioner, but he's not certified in HVAC. You've got to be careful. Certifications are highly important for what we do. I'm trying to figure out how my screens actually work here. So I'm hitting my buttons. Thank you. <clears throat> Mortgage company follow through is a process that is not easy. Most of you have probably had a claim that is tied up in the mortgage company process. True, not true? <laughs> Do you just want to kill yourself sometimes? Not like really, but you really get frustrated. We actually spend on average close to four hours per claim, four hours, office hours, assisting clients in processing checks through the mortgage system. 
Most public adjusters will not even assist the client. They ask for a fee, they sign the check, they say, pay me my fee, you deal with that process. I don't know if you've ever tried it, but you're on hold for a good hour occasionally. You have to provide, if, has anyone ever read the email from Q Finance that assists somebody in getting it? The W-9, the contractors, the releases, the, the sign-offs, uh, the hold harmless agreements, you name it. Depending on your mortgage, depending on the value of your mortgage, does everyone understand why it exists though so you're able to help someone answer the question? The mortgage company is placed on the check because they have an interest in the home. The mortgage company then has a process that is specific to the amount of the check, but it's also specific to the insured. So the insured may have a slow, low, slow payment history, which means they're gonna be more careful in releasing the funds. The insured may have a really slow payment history where it hasn't moved in months, uh, where again, that might be a more difficult process. We can still get through it. They may have a low loan to value ratio or a high loan to value ratio, meaning there's a lot of equity in the property, Therefore, there's less risk. So all of this put together allows us to assist insureds in getting those checks cleared through their mortgage company and assist them ultimately. And believe me, as well as we do it, it is way harder for an insured to do it. And it's still difficult even for us. You know, people ask me about uh, mitigation all the time. And we said we're certified with the ISCRC. Our vendors are certified with the ISCRC. They're all fully insured, but do, do you really understand the difference between mitigation and coordinating mitigation? If I was to clean ductwork prior to doing drywall repairs, it would be a complete waste of time and money because the drywall and the ductwork would then be recontaminated. If I didn't bring moisture content down to the building below 10% on average before firing up the HVAC and before getting rid of the drying equipment, we wouldn't technically have dried the building. This coordination means things have to be done in the right order or you have to do them all over again. So by uh, hiring an adjuster, allowing them to work with the specific vendors involved in that loss and doing the coordination of the proper timing of the repairs, what good is it to bring in the dumpster and dump, and dump the house if you haven't protected the driveway yet? Lots of little things that work behind each other. Most of them have to do with air quality and final construction. But if you're going to have sand and finish your floors, you can't have any dust in the property. You have to have a negative pressure before you start the, the urethane process. Again, general contractors, regular contractors, specific vendors may not actually be very good at this coordination. They'll end up doing something way out of order. And now you're walking on top of you know, protective material, trying to do a more delicate process. That coordination is incredibly important. Here's the, well, probably the more important factor. The industry is plagued with vendors that want to be public adjusters. There's roofers that want to be public adjusters. They call them storm chasers. There is mitigation firms that want to be public adjusters. Please they check in now. The work. They want to get in paid to do the dry out, paid to do the rebuild negotiate with the insurance company. It's illegal, but it happens. So forget about arguing that it's illegal. Do you realize that if you over mitigate a property, meaning you took too much out before you present it to the insurance company, you've breached what in the policy? Does anyone know the word I'm looking for? You breached the duty of the policy. There's a duty in the policy in the condition section that says you shall, you must. Shall and must, they always remind me of that wedding day right? Till death do us part, shall and must. My wife always says you're either committed or you're not committed, but you can't be half married, right? You can't say, well, I'm not married this weekend. When we were younger, we were dating. We used to say we're not in the same zip code, so it's okay to have another girlfriend. Once you're married, you, the rules are strict. Well, guess what? The rules are really strict as well when it comes to mitigation and the vendor world. Now, what we do as public adjusters on Please controlling check in mitigation now. is make sure that the, the duty of the insured is met. The duty is a requirement. If it isn't handled, you've breached the policy and they can do what to the claim? Deny the entire claim because you failed a duty. There's a duty to pay the premium. There's a duty to reduce the loss. There's a duty to mitigate the damages. If you breach one of these duties, the loss can be denied. I have people all the time, you know, they oh, I'll just let the, the rain keep coming in and ruin the sofa. 
Well, if you let the rain keep coming in and ruin the selfie, you've actually committed insurance fraud, but more oftenly you've breached the duty of the policy, therefore you're not paid for the loss. So controlling the proper amount of mitigation, making sure that the right amount is done to dry the property, just enough to still be able to demonstrate and exhibit the loss, which is a duty, by the way, you need to present the damage, another duty. So a contractor comes in and says, I'm just gonna demo this property and make lots of money. They may have actually put the client, client or the homeowner in a position where the damage can't be properly presented or exhibited, therefore they've breached a duty. This is very important to make sure just the right amount of mitigation is done. Our vendors are very skilled at this. We've even had challenges to a few of these throughout the year, but over thousands, we have one or two issues. So we know we're doing the right balance. Very difficult to do. Homeowners have to understand that their restoration contractor cannot handle this because it's the fox guarding the hen house. They want more. It's very easy to get trapped in this, but the, uh, our vendors are well aware of the line that is drawn in the sand for what can be done now to allow for proper presentation of damages to make sure that the duties are met and the loss is protected. Our property inspection and our uh, policy review, and we're really making some changes to that, I'm gonna show you this afternoon, our inspection process and our preemptive look at properties might be the best thing in the entire industry, but no one knows about it unless you're with Metro. Lori Fantini has some amazing stories of people that she's met with inadequate policies. Later in life, they've had large losses without that uh, original inspection or review or coverage, or even a discussion with somebody. They would have been out tens of thousands, in that case, over $100,000 in damage. Lori, by going in and saying, you have a policy that doesn't represent you, you need to change this, they do it. Later in life, they have a large loss. I mean, I tell a story, a personal friend of mine, uh, I tell it in AMT, uh, and I was thinking of Mark Gohan this morning, someone mentioned his name yesterday, and God, he just it brings tears to my eyes every time I think of Mark. And the story that I was telling in AMT with Mark uh, was if uh, we were, my kids were all swimmers. So I had five kids and we'd all, you know, go to the swim club every day for practice at six in the morning. And we raced every Saturday and we raced every Tuesday and there were divers every, every Friday night. Swimming was your life. So every time we went to the swim meet, the parents all signed up to be timers. You had to hold the stopwatches and the kids would come in to, you know, hit the timers and the laps. And it was a lot of fun, but it was very, very busy. Well, you, you got to meet lots of people, different clubs, different teammates. Well, Miss Florida was the, the, the wife of one of the swim kids. Miss Florida came in wearing Miss Florida swimsuit, I'm guessing every time too, because all the men would, you know, fawn over Miss Florida. She's a beautiful woman. So I got to give out the lane assignments one day. So like who was timer for each? And I'm gonna be a timer and I see Miss Florida on the list. I'm like, I'm in Miss Florida's lane. So I chat with Miss Florida all day long while we're doing the timing. And I look down and she's got a four carat diamond ring on and she's bragging that her husband just bought it for her. And I looked at the ring and I'm like, that thing had to be $100,000, which it was. And I said, do you have insurance on that ring? And she said, oh, I don't know. I said, where's your husband? His name was Tom. I meet up with Tom later. And I said, Tom, I said, a beautiful ring. I did timing today with your wife. I just want to make sure that you have good insurance on that ring. Hey, anytime you want to talk about it, let me know. And he goes, oh, I'm, I'm in the middle of getting my patio redone. I'm really busy right now. And I said, you know what? Let me just stop over the house. He goes, great. Why don't you come over Sunday? I'm having a football game. The contractor that's doing the patio just finished my basement. And all I said was, you just finished your basement. You have a patio. You bought a $100,000 ring. You're married to Miss Florida. I'm guessing he's got a couple bucks. And I said, who's your insurance company? He actually was a few years ago. He says Allstate. Now, granted, they've moved up a notch because farmers dug a hole underneath them. If your home is. So I said, you have no coverage in your basement. Your wife's ring will never get replaced. And if you're building a nice patio, I said, you're in trouble. You need me. And Tom goes, no problem. Whatever you want, Bill, I'll, I'll do whatever you recommend. So I go over to Tom's house. We talk for about 15 minutes. Here's my broker. You need trouble in your house. House insured for a million eight. 
He's got all estate. I mean, it's a nice property. So long story short, he calls my broker. He gets Chubb. He never even calls me back to say that I did it. Two years later, a year and a half later, somewhere in that range, uh, we, I think it might even have been Hurricane Sandy. This is how far back it goes. He calls me up and says, all of my neighbors had basement floods and they're all denied. And he goes, oh my God, Bill, you know, what do I do? And I said, did you ever change policies? He says, yeah, I did what you said, Bill. I got Chubb. I said, will you have coverage? And he says, no, I don't have coverage. All my neighbors told me I don't have coverage. My neighbors have good policies. My neighbors are rich and this. And we don't have coverage. I said, but you have Chubb. And he says, yeah, I said, you have coverage. So I said, no, I'll come over. I'll take care of it. He goes, Bill, you can't get down the street. It's a mess. There's trash. So I finally get there. There's black trash bags everywhere. I get to his house. I look at his deck page. Got Chubb Masterpiece. I call CPR. I think it was $50,000 in mitigation to clean out the basement. $50,000. Uh, they clean it all out. And he's looking at me like, oh, like you got coverage. I said, I'll take care of it. He's not reading the paperwork. He's all distraught. I'm busy talking to Miss Florida in the kitchen. <laughs> Full disclosure. So the claim settles and he never read the paperwork. He didn't read the percentage. He didn't read the fee. And he says, Bill, he says, I don't care if you charge me 99%. He says, without you, I wasn't going to get a dime. Got him about $150,000. And I said, well, the, you're looking at about $1,500 if you take 99% off the top. And he goes, Bill, I would give you 50%. I would have nothing without you. He played the standard fee and he was very, very happy. And he wanted to give me more than I charged him. But without our preemptive method, without our ability to inspect a property, without our, our ability to discuss policies and what they cover, he had nothing. And he truly recognized without our service, he had nothing. He said, the value of your service is 99% of what you got me because I was getting nothing. There is a person who had lots of money, a lot of success, $2 million house, and a public adjuster like one of you in the audience, one of you online, has the ability to do that same thing, to make that same recommendation, to talk to people, to make sure they have the coverage they need. And I tell you what, I never feel better than when I see him on the road. I never feel better than when I talk to Lori's client that had that coverage. I never feel better than when we turn around someone's claim. That feeling, that the, the emotion that Steve had this morning, I cried in the back as well the whole time Steve told that story. The emotions that are tied to our business are more powerful than the actual job itself. Embrace that and understand that that's what we actually provide for people. Does everyone know what this is? I need a word. It begins with the letter D. It is not delamination. Decompression. Thank you. So decompression, if you're a truck driver, that's that valve you pull that the truck goes, ah. That's a jake break. There you go. Someone who lives somewhere outside of the city, right? A little bit west of uh, the city. The jake break is what that is known as. It's a decompression lever. It's actually pulling open a valve and letting the engine pressure out, causing it to slow the engine. But anyway, decompression is when you buy a brand new sponge. We've all bought one of those. Oh, not Bill that Elaine was saving. Sponge worthy might have been the greatest episode of all time. Um, so decompression is that brand new sponge you have that has no moisture in it, and you go to put water on it, and it runs off the sponge because it has no, the surface tension is, is too great. So then eventually it gets wet and you see the whole sponge double in size. Well, laminate flooring is a brand new sponge. It is basically just highly compressed. Does anyone know the, the material that the uh, laminate floor is made out of underneath? It was wood. I love that word, was wood. Uh, it is actually called HDF, uh, high density fiberboard. It's basically cardboard, highly compressed. It's a really strong and durable product unless it gets wet. And obviously there's no such thing as water on a floor, a bucket, a kid, a soda, a water, a fridge or nothing. So flooring should never have been made out of this product, but they did. And it's the greatest gift of public adjusting ever because that exists in any house that has laminate flooring. That is the damage off the forehead of the guy that installed it as he sweated on the floor. 
It literally, yeah, flooring is the number one item. In my uh, the afternoon session today, we really are going to focus a little bit on it, um, as far as one of our new processes for assisting and taking pictures. You walk into a property, and if you can identify this, you've got a five to an eight thousand dollar claim almost automatically. The product can never be repaired. Identify decompressed flooring, and you're going to help your client. Now, here the client says, "I don't really care about this. That's not a lot of damage." I'm okay with that. You're not okay with that. The moment you slide a table across the floor and it catches that high spot, it takes a big chunk out of it. Now it looks horrendous. If you identify it now and you present the claim now, you have much better chance of coverage than after you slide a table across, you take a big chunk out of it because you technically have two losses. You may have a wear and tear issue at that point because they let it go so long. Right now, you have great claim, great coverage, undeniable, covered by every policy that has, it, depending on that cause, covered by every single all-risk policy out there. It's an accidental discharge. It's still going to be covered even by a two. So educating our insured on what we do is your job. It's actually not my job, right? It's your job. You talk to the insured more than we do. But do you ever hear that... Um, commercial where they say our best customer is an educated customer. Uh, I, I, so you're correct, right? The clothing guy, right? <laughs> Where's the teacher? But the more a customer knows or more a client knows about something, the easier it is to work with them. We, we deal with it in the adjusting industry. We can't stand what we call stupid adjusters. And I'm using the word stupid, it's crude. But they, they just don't know what they're talking about, so they say no blindly. They're unwilling to engage in conversation or to understand why a process is such. Homeowners that don't understand that the insurance company most likely will deny their claim. The insurance company most likely will underpay their claim. The insurance company won't fully investigate their damage. The insurance company will overly depreciate their claim. Their insurance company will not provide and tell them about all the benefits available to them. So when you have a client that understands what we do for a living, they will, the value of our services is far greater to them because they really understand what they're getting. So your job is to make them understand the risks and the hazards of doing this on their own. How many, how, how many people in this room have ever been audited by the IRS? Anyone in this room? Wow, bunch of criminals in the middle. Usually all those people are in the VIP section because that's how they got there, right? So if you've been audited by the IRS, you realize it's kind of a scary thing and you don't want to do it on your own. So the first call I make, I, I got audited last year. I called my accountant, he wrote three letters right away and he got me out of it really quick. But I wasn't going to do that on my own because I understand that it's a battle you're not going to win without professional representation. So understanding that your job to educate the insured is a big part of what Metro does by letting people know that this is a, a process that 30 years ago, 35, let's say 35 years ago, it was a lot easier to file a claim. Who was the best insurance company out there if you had wind damage to your siding or roofing 30 years ago? Does anyone know? Allstate. Who yelled Allstate? Someone yelled Allstate before me. I heard it. So Allstate was the best because Allstate and Sears were in ownership. I forget who owned who. But because Sears would write the estimate to replace the siding at $30,000 and you would hand it to the Allstate adjuster, the Allstate adjuster went, our own company wrote the estimate. They used to have to pay $30,000 every time you had a ding. So Allstate was the best exterior company. <clears throat> that changed. Uh, we didn't have farmers. We didn't have modified forms. All of these things have really changed in 30 to 35 years, <clears throat> which has made your job and the importance of what you do that much greater. So by letting people know what's out there. Uh, we talked yesterday in the adjuster meeting about an endorsement in the insurance policy that provides for an additional coverage known as the GRC endorsement or guaranteed replacement costs. Has everyone heard of that? GRC endorsement is one that multiplies coverage of coverage A in the event of a total loss for as much as 100% of the policy. So if you had 300,000 on coverage A, it could be 600,000. And there are actually true GRC policies that have no limit at all, but most of them are 20, 50, or even 100% more than coverage A. 
So that's a great backstop if you're underinsured, right? I got this extra 20% coverage, I have an extra 50%, whatever it is. Did you know that by doing a substantial improvement to the property without notifying the insurance company of $5,000, how many people find that a $5,000 improvement is really not all that substantial anymore, right? And if you did that, you lose the endorsement. So as a claim rep, I would tell every one of you to say, did, any, did you do, to a homeowner, did you do any substantial improvements to your property since you've had this policy? Put in a really nice kitchen, put in a sunroom, add a deck, finish a basement. And they say, yes. Well, you have this really great endorsement in your policy, which provides, and give the number, right? If it's 20%, State Farms is uh, 20%, increased cost of dwelling. 20%, so there's 400,000, that's an $80,000 endorsement, right? Did you know that because you didn't notify your agent of that improvement, you've lost your $80,000 in additional coverage? And all you have to do is make a phone call and they're gonna add about $8 to your premium because you told me your house is worth a little bit more money. So you'll walk into, I guarantee you, as you're doing property inspections, you are gonna find people that have done improvements to your house. They're proud of those improvements. They wanna show you those improvements, but they never told the insurance company and now they've lost $100,000 worth of coverage in their policy, you're gonna look like a total hero. Do me a favor, tomorrow, just notify your agent or broker that you made that improvement, give them a rough idea of what you spent on it. They're gonna adjust your premium lightly. It's gonna cost you a couple dollars a year, but you're adding back that $100,000 endorsement. Who finds that to be a lot of value? That's a lot of value. That's a great property inspection. So our business opportunity is why you're here. I don't think anybody is in this room to be a, a bigger philanthropist. I think you're all in this room to make more money. I think you're all in this room to make your life easier. Uh, you know, go on a better vacation, have a little more money, to pay off college, to get rid of this, to pay off, to, to get ready for retirement. It doesn't matter what your needs are, but our business opportunity is substantial. I've been in, you know, I was a carpenter when I got out of uh, high school, basically. I was in college, I met my wife. My father died. I basically had to drop out of college. I met my wife in college. We got married pretty quickly. We had five children before the age of 29. <laughs> I'm damn good, aren't I? 29. That's before big screen TVs. Once we got that, we stopped having kids. I couldn't figure out the relationship for a while. I told my kids, I'll never pay for your cable TV to each give me five grandkids. I sent them all copies of 50 Shades of Great for Christmas. No, true story, true story. I said, watch these videos and give me more grandkids. So our business opportunity, look at the math in our business opportunity. So if you sell a car, you make three or $400. If you sell someone a living room set in a furniture store, you make about $200. If you sell, um, uh, if you work for a company and you make $25 an hour or $50 an hour, um, you know, you work there all day for eight hours at $50 an hour, you make $400. In our business, the current fee averages in the company is about $3,000 on a claim on average throughout the year. That means that a claim rep at 30% is averaging $900. Please check in now. Claim. The, the amount of hours that you put into that claim, let's just say it's nine. That's $100 an hour, which is $200,000 a year at nine hours invested in the claim. I'm not going to assume you have nine hours in the claim, but just to do that math at four and a half, that makes it $200 an hour. That's $400,000 a year. Now, granted, we don't work every hour of the day, but we have the opportunity to work every hour of the day. You know, I, I actually yelled at some of the adjusters yesterday in a very nice way. Jay works all day. Yep. Every hour, every day. So I yelled at some of the adjusters yesterday. I, I ran a yearly report and our adjusters as a group on mass are very good. Look on the leaderboard. They're almost half the people on the leaderboard uh, generally, at least on the claim side. But if you take a look at the average adjuster and I said, you know what? You made 20 claims, 24 claims. That's two a month, two claims a month. $1,500 a claim the adjusters are getting because they're getting half, right? They're getting their adjustment and their rep side. So that's $3,000 a month in personal production, $36,000 a year on top of what they make as an adjuster. So $36,000 a year, that's not bad. You tell me that's about what Social Security will probably pay you when you retire. But if you just up that to one claim a week, that's $72,000 a year. 
$72,000 a year, now you're starting to change your life a little bit. And then if it's two claims a week, it's $144,000 a year. Writing two claims a week as an adjuster is $144,000 a year on average, plus your adjusting commissions. That's a job, that's a career, that's a lifestyle that allows you to put money away, it allows you to save. So if, you know, if you're thinking about becoming an adjuster in the company, it says I'm a really good claim rep and I'll adjust those losses, it's a commitment, but I can tell you there's a great opportunity and it does have its financial rewards. But you being here for the business means you need to focus on the things that build business, not just being the smartest adjuster and being able to answer every Kahoot question, because some of the people on that list that wrote two or three claims for the year would answer everything correctly, but they didn't do things correctly. They didn't tell their friends what they do. They don't embrace what they do. They don't challenge people. They don't ask people about their claims. They don't say, do you think you got a fair deal? They don't say, give me a shot. They don't say, let me take a look at it. They don't say, can I have an adjuster come over and just look at it? They don't say I can have an adjuster on your roof to do a Hague inspection. They don't say I can have an adjuster come out to take a look with a thermal image camera that you have to pay 700 bucks retail. It's free with our adjusters. They don't say that. You have that ability. That's your business. You have those abilities to offer. That's part of your services. They cost you nothing. We build that into your process. That's how you build your business. Oh, I think I just hit the wrong button. I hit the laser pointer, I think. We use the same systems the insurance companies use for a reason. If we were to use our own estimating systems, the insurance companies would say, we don't care what you say because our systems say this. So between our adjusters, it's about $100,000 a year in total fees to Xactimate every year, just for our licensing, paid by the adjusters, by the way. But if we don't use their systems, we don't provide a great benefit to the insurers. I guarantee you most of the small public adjusting firms do not use Xactimate just because it's cost prohibitive. They use uh, cheap, generic estimating systems that don't provide value to your insurers. Not that the system is good. The value is the fact that we're willing to pay the money to have the same system the insurance companies do to keep the arguments, to keep the valuations, and to keep the process fair for your insurance. It's not the system learning how to write. It has nothing to do with that. It says we'll play in the same sandbox as you because we'll beat you at your own game and we'll use the same bat. We won't grab an aluminum bat. We'll play with the wooden bats just like you have, but we will use those systems. That's a value to your clients. They need to understand that. You need to show that it's not Xactimate. That has no power to me. That has no value to me. Xactimate is only being used for one reason, to give your clients a better value so that our estimates and our arguments are on the same page and we can ultimately get better settlements for your insurance because we're willing to use their systems. A typewriter can write a phenomenal novel and it can write a horrible sentence. The typewriter is the system, it means nothing, but we need to use the same library and the same language they use. So all of the data that we use today and uh, this afternoon's class is on our digital data. But our digital data that we use today to document damages is phenomenal. We document with moisture meters. We document with lasers for measurements. We document with thermal imaging for captured moisture behind buildings. We document with moisture mapping, which shows how far water traveled, where it's at, where it's trapped. Using thermal imaging, which again is about a $700 system, <clears throat> $700 charge for someone to come out and do, we're able to document losses where the insurance company used to say, you have to prove it to me. You have to show it to me. We don't have to take the wall down anymore. All of our adjusters use thermal image cameras, thermal imagery cameras. Do you sell that? Do you use that? So when someone says, I have a little bit of damage, I don't know when it happened, and we're all trying to figure out when it happened, when the adjuster comes out with a thermal image camera, they can see if there's still water in there right now. Right now, I can read it. You can read it with your moisture meter. Last year's convention, everybody got a moisture meter. And when they made a mistake, they played that video and they honoring giving out that uh, laser today to anyone who registers today because we played that video. But we gave everyone a laser and a moisture meter last year. And it was expensive, you know, $50, $60 for uh, those 
moisture meter. Use that tool. Walk out. When, you're, when you identify water damage, and someone said, Lori used it on every loss now, right? I swear to you, I'm like, Lori, are your batteries dead? Right? Because she, she'll come out, or, or she uses like high power batteries because it's always reading 100%. But Lori lives by that device now. But if, if a client says to me, I'm not sure when that happened, and I hold a moisture meter up and it's at 88%, beep, 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 beep. They go, I guess it leaked last night. We have no more arguments. It is wet. It did leak. It is still an active loss. When people see that device go off, they're, they're, it's validated. It's validated claim. It's validated loss. It's validated coverage. It's everything in one little device. It's not your word anymore. Meters don't lie. People love devices. All of that technology combined is what you're selling. It's what you're offering. This is not the process of your standard public adjuster. The industry, by the way, is getting old, the industry. The technology is getting amazing. The amount of people entering the industry is probably coming down. And I'll say it's the relics that are out there. The adjusting industry itself is getting older. I deal with people on average 55, 60 years old in a meeting every day. They don't adapt to the new change. They don't understand the new technology. They haven't really changed over that system, <clears throat> meaning they're not new people coming in to be senior adjusters in the insurance side. The public adjuster industry, Metro itself, is cutting edge on technology. Digital calipers measuring to 10 thousandths of an inch, using light to show through and show voids to calculate with images, scaling software, so much that we do behind the scenes. That's your product, that's your business, that's what you sell. You know, it is really hard. I and mean, we met with all the attorneys yesterday. Uh, they all spoke with the adjusters. And uh, Merlin Law Group is here. Scott Gallen is here. Anthony Diolio is here. They all spoke to the adjusters for about an hour yesterday. Uh, Dan Ballard's actually coming in virtually today. And some states, lawyers can't represent clients unless the loss is over $250,000. How many of them have, do you have? Right? The average loss is about 12 grand. So how many 250s do you think you have? So if you can't get a lawyer for a loss under $250,000 and you have a problem, you have one choice. You have a public adjuster. Right? Lawyer's not going to help you. Loss is under that. You, a client, has never, and a, let's say a, a modest client, let's say middle America, $75,000 a year job, $350,000 house, 124,000 miles on their Honda, praying it doesn't break next month, college loans for the kids, paid off the credit cards twice last year, still working on it again. That's middle America. That's everybody. How often do they have lawyers to hammer you know, their, their neighbor for an issue or to argue about the value of something? There's, the funds aren't available for that. Having a public adjuster to be able to come in and give ridiculous service. <laughs> I love the analogy right now. <laughs> we had a discussion about the fans uh, last night at dinner. Having an adjuster available to come in and represent you at the full legal level. It is the same as an attorney. We're not attorneys, but it's the same level of expertise with the policy, the presentation, the valuation. When your clients have that service available to them, at middle America with virtually no charge to them, with virtually no risk to them, with an incredible upside potential to them. It's a game changer. It lets middle America into the world of power players. It lets them into the world of getting paid fairly. It lets them into not getting ripped off. It lets them getting into, there isn't two sides of justice. They can be represented just as well as the big boys that always have proper representation, always have all the lawyers that don't care about the cost to get it resolved. They have the money to get it done. This service, our service, public adjusting, Metro, not many public adjusters will take $5,000 losses. They won't do it. Metro will. That's a great service. That's a great value to your customer. You know, in, as far as the industry goes, it changes every day, and you've seen these policy changes, right? Anthony, he'll scream all day on TikTok about what's going on, 
And I don't disagree, but I also know that every time something swings down, it swings back up. And we may be on the downward side of the pendulum or the left side of the pendulum right now, but I can tell you, I see positive light coming through. So the policies that became anti-matching over the last five to seven years are starting to offer what's called matching endorsements because their customers are tired of getting told no. The agents are tired of telling people. But guess what they need to do to sell matching? They need to charge you a little more money. So now it's $80 by travelers to get a matching endorsement for your roofing and siding, the HQ700 and HQ701. And I'm like, wow, that's pretty amazing. For $80, you'll match the siding. When I go out with a traveler's adjuster now, we, we stand at the car before we walk up to the house and I go, 700, 701? And they look at me and go, yeah, we're good. Just like that because they are now allowed to pay for matching because the customer has a matching policy. So, I mean, we literally laugh, 700, 701, they're like, yep. I'm like, we're good, we just keep walking. So now that you're starting, the, H, the 700, 701 are better than the old policy before they even exclude it because it says we will match, not we might, not that we don't exclude it, but now it says we will. Uh, so a uh, lot of companies are coming out with matching endorsements. Now, State Farm took their policy, which had a $10,000 limit on some pump, and State Farm's horrendous. It is uh, Tony's uh, nemesis. He hates them. He says, at least farmers tells you they suck. State Farm tells you they're good, but they really suck. Uh, apologize for the brutal language, but that's exactly what Tony said. Um, so State Farm changed their sump pump endorsement. How many people wrote a sump pump claim on September 1st? Well, we did 450 of them, I think, right? So they were a no-brainer. They were so easy. So, but they changed their endorsement with their new policy from $10,000 limit, which is horrible, by the way, to 5% of coverage A. Well, the average house was being written at 500 grand. We're getting $25,000 now on these endorsements instead of $10,000. 250% more on the sump pump endorsement. So the changes are coming. They will go up and down. I don't get frustrated when I see them go down. I find ways around them. I don't get, laminate flooring is not being made anymore, but it'll be here for 10 more years. It'll still be in the houses, but all the manufacturers are making waterproof flooring because they realize that, you know, when someone sweat on it, it destroyed the floor. So our industry, Metro through Appia, through all of the associations that we work with, really do protect the insured's rights. This is our mission. You know, a huge percentage of our profits for the year, a huge percentage of those go to this effort. Go to making sure that laws aren't passed that adversely affect your client. Go to lobbyists to make sure that they don't bring in laws that say you can't have a public adjuster. <clears throat> The industry would love to say no public adjusters unless the loss was over 100 grand. They try and do that by limiting fees because you can't do a 10% fee on a $3,000 loss. You can't afford to even drive there. By this industry representation, by what we do with Metro, by our associations like Appia, we are protecting insurance rights and they don't even know it. Guess what? We don't have to tell them what we do, but they have to understand what we do. So you can talk about it that we, we spend our efforts and our time making sure that they'll be protected from now till you know, long after you've met them in their uh, living room or dining room. So does everyone hear the story? Toilet backed up is not covered, but the toilet that overflowed is. Everyone know that? Toilets that back up aren't covered. Toilets that overflow are. Talk to a homeowner and say, did you realize that a toilet that backs up isn't covered, but one that overflow is? Can you tell me the difference? Because either one has a Hot Wheel truck in the bottom of the toilet or 43 feet of toilet paper, whatever. They don't know that these small amounts of causation, the language that is used in the policy is specific. Here's how the, home, here's how the insurance industry rates a policy. They call up a thousand people like a poll and they say, uh, has your toilet ever spilled water on the floor? Can you describe it? Yeah, my toilet backed up. Okay. Has your basement ever had water? Yeah, my basement flooded. Has your um, sump pump ever failed? Yeah, it, it backs up. And they take all the language that people say. I'm making this up. 
And then that, that's what they call their exclusion. How everybody in the world explains it is how they decide their exclusions. And honestly, if you were to call your agent and describe the loss, the way the exclusion is written, you said I had a toilet backup. And an agent most likely will say backups aren't covered. Go to cover, go to page 15A, you'll see it. And I swear to you, you'll go to 15A and they'll say exclusion backup. Do you know how many people read the water exclusion and think that applies to the plumbing loss? So water is an exclusion in the homeowner policy. Water is defined. It's an exclusion. You have no coverage for water damage in a policy ever, ever. There's no homeowner policy that covers water. We, we always have coverage for water. You actually don't. You have coverage for an accidental discharge or overflow of a sealed plumbing system. The ensuing water that came out is actually what caused the damage, but the coverage is the accidental discharge. I mean, it's a really fine line. But if you read a policy, water is defined as a body or a spray or an overflow or a collection of basically surface water. But it's not water from a plumbing system because the plumbing system water is actually only covered if it fails in the plumbing system and overflows from it. So it's a crazy little policy, but our causation, our ability to determine where that event came from, what that original cause was, was it ensuing, was it proximate? Because power failure is not a covered loss. It's excluded in the policy. But power failure triggers all kinds of coverages. Power failure triggers food coverage. Power cover failure triggers sump pump. Power, cover power failure triggers almost everything, but itself is not a covered loss, but it is a trigger. Our adjusters are trained at such a high level. Our claim reps are trained at such a high level. You're getting what, six hours, five hours of training today? You're probably, if you do the conference calls, and I'd like to just give me a big stick and beat anyone in this room that doesn't do the conference calls, but I'm assuming the ones in this room do the conference call. You're going to get little chunks of information. Uh, my father, when I was a kid, my uncle invited me to a Phillies game. My mom said, you're not taking a day off of school. And my father said, you don't learn anything in one day of school. And my mom is screaming. My uncle wants to take me to the game. My uncle did take me to the game, and I got a baseball. My dad said, you don't learn anything in one day. And he's true. You learn little bits of information that accumulate over your life. You actually can't learn. If I teach you for 15 straight hours, if you've ever done the adjusting class, you know, it's eight days, eight hours a day. At the end, your, your mind is blown. You can't learn all that. You don't retain that. But you do retain 15 minutes of information every week. You retain half of that. But at the end of the year, you've had 50, 15 minutes. At the end of a convention, you might have went to nine classes, remember half of them. At the end of an annual meeting, you might remember one of them. But you add them all up, you've had 50, 60 hours of training. That's more than you need for almost any career out there. Best trained adjusters in the industry, best knowledge reps in the industry, most informed reps in the industry. We try and make it fun. We try and make it interactive. But overall, the training is what makes you successful. Anthony couldn't do his TikTok videos without everything he learned from the smart claims. He couldn't do it right. Anthony basically Please says, check here's my now. model. I'll watch what Bill says and say it in a really cute and funny way, right? Truthfully. Truth, truthfully, right? So the smart claim, by the way, is the, the best thing we've added to Metro in years. So the smart claim tip, if you haven't watched it or don't share it, it's the best marketing piece you could have with all of your customers. Send it out to them. Say, just watch this video. It's funny. If you have any questions, let me know. Spend four, I'm getting them down. I'm bringing them down to about five minutes. And I'm trying really hard. CBLs me all the time. They're too long. The smart claim video is knowledge for you. You should learn it. You should know it. You shouldn't be surprised by anything I say in a smart claim video. You should go, yep, I knew that. But you should be sharing it. It's a good question. It's a good piece. Uh, and basically, Anthony's turned his business into, uh, you know, doing that exact model. Th thank you, sir. Thank you. Does anyone realize the danger in overclaiming a loss by sending in an estimate that's too great? Does anyone realize the, da the, the risk? If I go out to a commercial loss and I overestimate it, I could potentially put the loss into what's called a coinsurance situation. Most people only knew coinsurance when they took their test because they had to learn that stupid formula, right? 
amount required over amount carried times the percent of coinsurance in the policy. Bill, that's so technical, shut up, I'm bored. I get it. But your consumer needs to know that you can't ask for too much money on a claim, or you could actually cause that claim to fall into what's called a penalty phase of coinsurance, where the insurance company says, yeah, we'll give you all that money, but we'll apply a penalty, which is basically about a two to one factor. You'll lose more money than you would have gotten because you overclaimed. Our ability as adjusters to spot the coinsurance risk early and to present and prepare an RCV and an ACV calculation to decide which way to present the claim is so important. It is not the same as just a contractor writing a big fat estimate. It can kill a claim. People think you just, oh, I got $100,000 limit. They submit a $100,000 estimate. It can kill the claim. You might end up with four grand out of that if you did it wrong. Uh, and they'll say, yep, we agree with you. And once they agree with you, you go, yes. And then the coinsurance penalty is kind of locked in stone. Uh, yeah, we got time on them, please. I did not bring my charger. What do you got? Thank you very much. Uh, I'm on blood thinners. I cut myself shaving this morning. I said, I'm going to leave that little scab right there because I will die if I pick it. It just keeps bleeding. <clears throat> The no claim assistance, somebody has a situation. I do, I don't know, 50, 100 of these a year where you run out to their home and take a look. If they don't have a claim, I thank them. I say, thank you for calling me. You have no claim here. Thank you for calling me. Here's how I would fix it. Thank you for letting me run out. Oh, I have wasted your time. No, you're my best customer ever. I thank them. The no claim opinion is phenomenal. It's another marketing opportunity. It's another contact. It's another connection. It's more, more guarantee that when they do have something, they will call you. I need you to call me when you have the dumbest thing happen. Looks like my contractor sweat on the laminate floor. What do you think, Bill? Right? And they think it's a dumb call. I'm like, no, nope, that's a good call. You got a good claim. Here's eight grand. So it is very important to realize that the no claim opinion is part of our model. It's not a CWP. But it could be a CWP. You go out and look at it and say, I, I need an adjuster to come out here. You write up a claim, we close it. That's a no claim opinion, right? Hey, if it's a claim, my adjuster will, will approve it. If not, we'll close it. No risk to you. Would you like to have him come out, do a head inspection on the roof, look for hail? Would you like him to come out, run a thermal image and see if there is water trap there? Would you like him to see if it, it's worth it with your deductible? It's a no claim opinion. When not to file a claim is actually just as important as when to file a claim. It's going to be too small. It's going to put your policy into jeopardy. You might have a, a, a risk at the property. You might have aggressive dogs. You could have like in the backyard, you could have like pit bulls jumping on trample, trampolines. You know, that's probably an issue. Um, or you could be like Steve and have a zip line. But long story short is there could be times when you shouldn't file a claim either for its value, uh, how long you've been in the house, it's within the first 60 days. There could be more risk to the claim than its value, and that decision should be discussed, and our adjusters would obviously make that recommendation whether or not to file the claim. It's really hard for claim reps to hear sometimes if a claim is good, but the risk on the adverse side of the claim is bad, that's a value to your client. Give them that information, we'll give them that information, let them make that ultimate decision. I've had clients say, I really don't care about that bill, still file the claim, but I've given them the information. I said it was risky and it, it turned out okay, but they were aware of the risk, right? Kind of like the doctor, hey, you, you, know, you might you know, walk funny after this. Well, at least I'm walking, right? I'll take the risk. Steve's still not walking. Did you see that hip? He's got, he's the only guy I know with a handicapped spot and he comes walking in and He's, well, that hip's looking bad. I told him that Iron Man, that'll kill him. Uh, exercise is very dangerous. Stay away from the treadmill. That could hurt you. I don't, I walk, I'm like the dog. I walk in that room and go, oh, no, 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 no. So most policies, I think all policies, have a statutory limit on when to file a claim. That basically means that if the claim beats a certain age, you could never file a suit, therefore you lose all leverage. 
Some states, it's really difficult. Pennsylvania is a tough state. It's a hard statute, one year from the date of loss, no matter what you do. Doesn't You don't have to file the claim in a year, you have to settle it. New Jersey's got a tolling statute. Florida's got a pretty generous statute. Maryland's got a pretty generous statute. But by telling a client or advising a client that they have or an identified claim and it's existing in their property, you're gonna give them that opportunity. In other words, if they don't file the claim and this happens, they may never be able to do so later. That option that you provide the client to say that, hey, here's, here's a claim. I know it's getting close to your statute. Let's let the adjuster talk about it. But if you don't file it, you may never be able to file it. So some people want to put things off. And this says, well, if you don't file it, you may never be able to. It's kind of a deal closer for some people. They, they go, wow, really? I have to have it done? Yes, you do. So even though it's old and it was just identified, it's very possible that it still needs to be done now. A lot of paperwork, a lot of documents. You've seen it, even DocuSign, which is efficient. It's still a lot of work. You get fast at it. I know some people are really getting good at it. Uh, we have a, a nice property inspection form coming out uh, for claim reps, really gonna be helpful. Uh, but a lot of paperwork, a lot of these forms that we fill in, the proof of loss, subrogation receipts, um, some releases, Homeowners aren't comfortable with them. They don't know how to do it. We do most of the work, allow them basically to sign documents. I can actually read that easier than that. Some claims today have eight and nine appointments. The insurance industry is relying heavily on experts to be insulated from their decisions. So if an insurance company adjuster says, I'm gonna send out someone to look at the floor and they give them a report and they say, oh, we're not gonna cover it. The insurance company is what's known as insulated because they relied on the, the report of an expert and they didn't make the decision themselves and it keeps them from being sued for bad faith. Part of our process, but I, you can ask Lori, I've inspected losses three, four, and five times, but it's all under one contract and one fee. There's no extra charge. If I had to go to the dentist and cancel my appointment five times, they would charge me each time. All under the original contract, we have to meet with contractors, vendors, experts, roofers, engineers, all part of that same inspection process. Most homeowners don't have an extra five days to take off of work. Almost all of them meet me on the first appointment and then I tell them I got to reinspect it. They're like, Bill, just open the house and feed the dog and see yourself out. Uh, but this is, this is a big issue today. A lot of people that have changed jobs, they don't have three, four unlimited weeks vacation. They have five days this year and they don't wanna blow it on five inspections. Thank you, Mike. There's your thermal imaging. Take a look what we see through the cameras, through the FLIRs, uh, but all losses, we're able to really digitally and document loss. We're able to represent them on any claims. All coverage is very important to understand that additional, I could talk for the next hour on ALE and what's available. Is anything not covered under ALE? Everything. Anything can be covered under ALE, depending on the scenario. Airfare can be covered under ALE. Renting a hotel room, having a, a wedding in this ballroom could be covered under ALE. Does anyone know how that would happen? If I was going to have it at my house and I can't use my house, I now need to rent a venue, it's covered. ALE can be the, in fact, if you want to be a, a phenomenal adjuster with Metro, if you want to be a phenomenal claim rep with Metro, when you write a loss that has the potential for ALE, understand it, learn it, talk to me, say, Bill, I want to learn anything there's no about ALE, you will find that your clients have such a better satisfaction of the claim process when they get taken care of through additional living expenses because the policy allows for normal standard of living. It's actually better than the normal standard of living, what it allows for. Positive claim view, everything can be looked at two ways, right? The, the half full, the half empty. We always take the half full side. We always take the, this should be covered the way I see it. We don't look at it as the other way. Having someone on your side that believes in you has anyone had a child that you go to school and the teacher says that your kid acted up in school? You had one of them? If not, I'll give you one of my five because I was there for all of them. So all five of my kids were called into the principal at some time in their life for misbehaving, one kick the ball over the roof, 
one took someone's pen. I, it didn't matter, right? I always sort of believed the teacher, by the way, it behind me, but I always let my kids know I was there for them. But I'm like, oh yeah, he did this for sure, right? I can tell you right now, I can see the smirk on his face. He's like, I had the cops knock on my door at four in the morning, four in the morning beating down my door. I literally was looking at the door. Did you break the door? And they're like, your kid was pool hopping. I'm like, you woke me up because my kid jumped in a pool. It's 104 degrees out. Really? Shouldn't that just be legal? At 100 degrees, shouldn't it be legal? So my son comes out of his bedroom with the police at the door, the one they're accusing of pool hopping. Uh, and it, and he, he's, his hair's dry. It's all frizzy. And he, oh, you know? And I'm looking at him and the cop goes, he's holding the sneakers. And the cop goes, uh, these sneakers were by the pool. And I look at, yeah, they're his sneakers. <laughs> but honestly, our ability to defend a client is based on this positive view. And it's very important that we maintain that and we'll never give that up. That is a huge part. Today, memorializing a loss and taking photos and putting all that documents together to make sure they're protected is a huge part of our business. There's, we haven't lost a photo in nine years uh, with redundancy and web servers, it's huge. Presenting losses with their proper policy language as an accidental discharge overflow of a sealed plumbing system uh, compared to a water loss. A huge part of what we do is making sure a claim is notified under the correct Pearl or loss description. Most homeowners will call a loss in incorrectly. I, I literally will tell a client, did you call it in? And they'll say, yes. I said, what did you say? And I go like this, oh. And they say, what? I said, I'll fix it. Sometimes you can't fix it, right? Sometimes people dig too big of a hole. We have a huge internal support structure. Uh, you know, nothing gets done anymore without AOD and we're, we're changing the way we do our processes. We're monitoring more on a digital level. Uh, every time we make these changes, the adjusters want to kill everybody because it's harder. Uh, but I can tell you it's getting focused, it's getting more efficient, and it's getting more accurate, but it is working overall. Not letting an insured file a claim that might be denied is important as well. We'll say, listen, I think you're going to get denied on this. My advice would be not to present this claim. Here's how I do this in the future. Here's what I would recommend. Here's how I would proceed. But my honest advice is don't file this claim. The odds on success are incredibly low. Again, half full claim perspective, very important. Clients can be emotional. It's their home, it's their stuff. Adjusters come in and can eliminate that emotion and can present that claim based on the facts of the policy. Homeowners can really change the attitude of an adjuster by being so attached to things when the homeowner's emotions are focused on a very minimal part of the claim that may actually be excluded, when the value is in something the consumer has no concern over, we're going to focus on the value side of the claim, even though the insured wants to push the other way, eliminating that emotion can be incredibly valuable to the entire claim process. Serious professionals in our industry, our certifications, our expertise goes beyond what is normal in the claim process, all additional coverages. There are so many coverages in a policy today from green coverages, which would provide for solar upgrades, water shutoff systems, uh, vegetative roof coverage, increased seasonal energy efficiency rate, ratings when they do the repairs on their HVAC equipment. These are actually available in the policies today. Percentage multipliers such as debris, landscaping, code, Green uh, guaranteed replacement cost. Code is becoming a huge issue. We did talk about an independent view of the settlement. We take about 4% of claims to legal or appraisal, but that documented claim that goes to legal or appraisal, do you know we're 97 or 98% successful in appraisal and we're 99 point something percent successful in legal? We don't make a ton of money when a claim ends up in that process, but it's there for your client and it's there to protect them. And ultimately their success is our goal. Follow through with all legal settlement alternatives. If it has to go to appraisal, if it has to go to legal, if it has to go to mitigation, mediation, all of these are part of our original contract 
in our process. We do not submit additional bills. There are expenses in some of these processes, but ours does not. I could speak for the next two days on material identification is changing at a rate beyond which we can even train right now. Fiber cement siding is becoming common. Metal roofing is becoming common. Cork flooring is coming back from the 50s, for God's sakes. Uh, but if you don't identify the material properly today, we have concrete tile, porcelain tile, terrazzo tile, marble tile, you name it. We have sealed, we have embedded, we have frost free, we have not. If you don't identify these materials properly, you have poor valuations. And I can tell you by firsthand experience, insurance adjusters are horrendous at identifying materials. They're wrong nine out of 10 times. Wayne will tell you. We walk in and go, no, that's not what that is. Post-restored items, after a loss is done and things are clean, they may still need to be paid for, even though the insurance company said, we cleaned all your clothes. Well, it's all shrunk. It's got color bleed and it still looks bad. Clients have busy lives today. There's not a lot of free time. We all see what's going on. It allows clients to do what they do, go, go to work and make money. I, I can build my entire house without any help. From excavation, to finalization of the house. The only thing I don't do is paint. I go to work and let my painter paint. I continue my life, let my painter paint. In this case, let them go to work, let them make their money, pay us for our services and get, our, get your claim handled professionally. Ultimately, the policy does allow for more money. You notice it's one of the last things I talk about. It really has nothing to do with what we do because if we do what we do, it just means more money. If you did everything we just talked about in the last 40 slides, that would be more money. So ultimately, don't focus on money. Focus on what we do, how we do it, why we do it. And if you talk about what we do, how we do it, why we do it, it makes sense that this will then benefit a client for how they see the value of what they did. Can I even read that slide? So the tricks and traps in the industry are pretty common, right? Getting a consumer to talk about denied coverage, getting a consumer to talk about occurrences. I love when they say, I see the roof leak. Oh, is it going to leak tomorrow with the rain? They ask us all the time. Yeah, it will, unless you fix it. I'm like, oh, another deductible. Did it leak yesterday when it rained? Yeah, well, I see your data loss is July, and it rained 11 times since July. So we have 13 deductibles here. Does that sound fair? Tricks and traps in the industry can be difficult. I go backwards. One of the toughest things to do is rebuild a total house after a fire, putting all the personal property together. We start with a 6,000 item base list as a trigger and say, do you think you have these items? And they keep checking them off and we start with the base list. Then we do an interview, talk to the client, what are your hobbies? Where do you shop? What do you buy? And if you talk to a woman, it's like, just can we get through the shoe stores now? Once we're through the shoe stores, we go to the clothing stores, and then we go to the jewelry store, and then we go to the perfume store, and then we go to the makeup store. Did you know there's an average of $1,000 worth of makeup in the woman's drawer? I call it the wrinkle cream graveyard. So I open up the drawer, and it's every snake oil serum to make you look 20 again in one drawer. Some of that stuff's 100 bucks, you know? And it's got great names on it, right? It's like, ooh, rejuvenation regeneration, thousand bucks in that drawer, a couple thousand bucks in that drawer. We use technology beyond belief today. We no longer take, take, we no longer measure roofs. It's all by satellite. It's all, I tell people all the time, I've already shot your roof by satellite before I got here. They're like, oh, cool. Uh, we do present the entire claim. Most adjusters get really angry at this, but part of the claim involves this. Part of the claim involves this. Yes, that is part of this loss. That can be a challenge for adjusters sometimes. Our systems are now making a life a lot easier by having online documents, by sharing electronic documents. We get pictures to adjusters immediately using links and uh, technology to make it so fast. Our contact database, people will tell me, Here, I'll say, who's your adjuster? They left a message. I'm like, I have his number, look. And I'll put it in my phone and it comes up with his first name. And they're like, wow, you do. We have the numbers, we have the contacts. You know, future coverages, which people don't have, I say that you should always recommend scheduling the engagement ring. You can never go wrong. See a ring, don't see coverage. Say, listen, I see you have an engagement ring. I'm sure your husband or yourself would not want to lose that. 
I don't see coverage on your policy. Sump pump is the biggest one. Focus on that. Everybody loves to know that the ring should be insured. It's a hundred bucks a year. When they lose the ring, they now have coverage. When you lose your ring under an HO3, you have zero coverage. Under theft, you have 1500 bucks. Sort of worth getting the ring insured. <clears throat> it's a pretty easy process. Call you, come to the house, get it done, get it moving. I'm moving a little quickly just due to time constraints. If you've noticed, I've picked up my pace. We're only there when people need us. You don't need to pay me every year. I'm not Melaleuca. I'm not, you know, I don't have to buy vitamins from me every month. You can have a public adjuster forever and you only pay for our services when you actually use them. You can always call for advice. There's no charge. You can always learn. I would keep your clients in the loop constantly. Share the smart claims, ask questions, follow up on storms, large loss dates. You should say, oh my God, did you see yesterday's storm? And reach out to every single person you know and just say, listen, huge storm last night. I'm crazy busy. Just want to make sure you're okay. I can stop by any time in the next week, two, three, four, five to take a look if you'd like. I can have an adjuster out to look at your roof. Your neighborhood got hit hard, one or the other. Your job should be follow up with your clients after, some, some, after any substantial storms. I think that's it. Did I make it to the end, Andrew? Thank you, everybody. I'm sure we're swapping out um, slideshows in a moment. Thanks, guys.